10 horsepower live here at the Engine Performance Expo. Joe Costell, Lake Speed, and we are joined by the man, Keith Dorton from Automotive Specialist Racing Engines, NASCAR legend. Lake, this is another mega interview. Oh, it is. Now, Keith's been on hidden horsepower before. Yes. Just like Mark had, but again, we're, we're seven miles from Bristol Motor Speedway. <laughs> this is, we gotta bring back some NASCAR action here, so who best to have here? Mm -hmm. Plus, there's such a, uh, great story arc with Keith that, you know, not only did you have a, have had a legendary career, your brother Randy uh, had a legendary career before he, he passed tragically, uh, but then you've had this whole other life with Bonneville and your son Jeff, and it's, your, your family is amazing, actually. I mean, you're kind of like the the crown prince family of engine building, really, if, I, I'm, if I'm thinking about it. <laughs> you know, I mean, who, who else's family has had that much success? Well, I think your family's. They've done all right. We've right. been okay. Right. And, uh, and I, I really appreciate that. That's uh, very flattering. Well, I mean, I mean <clears throat> there's not a lot of guys who've been able to adapt the way you have. You know, to from the early days in NASCAR, you you and Mark, you know, last night and having dinner, I was I was loving it. He, he just straight out asked you, "What about those things in the manifold?" Right? Yeah. <laughs> we didn't get to that in a minute, but yeah. it's that. And then you know, I guess when you and I first met each other, you were doing the the Pro Cup engines, you know, mm -hmm. for Joey Logano, and when he came to Gibbs, and then next thing I know, there's Bonneville engines in there, and all, all of these things. Is I, I, what I me? Mean, what is it? What what? drove you to keep finding these new opportunities? I think it was the desire to see how things worked and to mm. try to make them better. Yeah. Uh, you know, the just like most of us in this industry, we started out with um, go-karts or a little, yep. you know, single cylinder engine that you took off a lawnmower and, and you tried to understand how it worked. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, I'm still trying to understand that. <laughs> But, uh, but the no. engines are infinitely complex. Right. That's what I love about them. Mm -hmm. You never get to the end answer. But uh, that's true. But I, I've been very blessed, and just like you bringing up uh, Randy. Mm -hmm. Randy started with me at a very young age. Mm -hmm. He was very intrigued by mechanical things, also, mm -hmm. and we worked together. You know, just like that for years. And and it came time for him to go off to school, mm -hmm. and uh, then he he decided he wanted to kind of be on his own right which was great you know it was it, you know he had to lose and i didn't lose him <laughs> but you know it was hard to we needed to help you know right you know i was i was oh yeah it's, it's, I, was, it's, I was greedy you right know? yeah but he went on with uh Sox and martin and some of those drag race teams and then of course got hooked up with uh uh harry hyde and and then with rick mm -hmm. and uh, you know i'm so proud of the accomplishments that he made and uh, as we talked earlier uh, my son started mm -hmm. you know when he was able to push a broom or whatever and uh, and I had that fear oh he's gonna want <laughs> <laughs> <Me too. Yeah. laughs> he's gonna want to you know go out and, mm -hmm. and uh, make the big bucks and so forth but uh, fortunately he has stayed with me and uh, you know uh, like again I'm so blessed to have that family atmosphere that we've carried on now for quite a while. You, and you do, you, you see it when you walk in your shop. You walk in the front door, you know, you're there, Jeff's there, your wife's there, it, it is, it's family. And how long have y'all been over there in that, in that building? And the building we're in now will be 20, 22 years, I guess. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, we actually, Feb come February, I guess, we'll uh, have been in business 57 years. 57? Wow. It's a pretty good number, right? That well, think. some of the early customers, right? Ralph Earnhardt. Like I, I, I bring that up each time I speak with you because I think that <clears throat> proves the point. Like OG, right. engine builder. You go back to Dale's dad, who started this trend, and without Ralph, there's no Dale. Without Dale, there's who knows where NASCAR is right now. Well, you know, and I took a lot of that for granted. That I didn't know. I didn't realize you know, how important those relationships were right. until later. Uh, but we've been very fortunate to work with people like Ralph, Dale, Dale Jr. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, 
Rusty Junior Johnson, you know, um, uh, the the list goes on. Of course, my background was Holman and Moody, right? With Lorenzen and you know all those guys. Talk about Fireball. that for a minute, yeah. Because I I think that's a, one of those miss stories. You know, it's almost lost on. Okay, we know Charlotte is this hub of activity with NASCAR and everything, but that home and moody part of that was that that had to be like the genesis of why that was so big. Yes, it it, it was, and I you know when I was growing up, I never dreamed that. Uh, I guess I never grew up, but but when I was young, I never thought that I could fit in in a place like that. But okay, I, I just didn't you know. Uh, I wasn't so much intimidated, but uh, what am I going to do there? Because I'm, I don't have all this knowledge. But I remember I went, a friend of mine had a job over there. He said, you need to come because, you know, there might be a place for you there. So uh, I went and they, I did get the job working in the uh, parts department for a very short while. Okay. And then they put me in the uh, fab shop. And I remember going the first time, and my toolbox was a little Craftsman, mm -hmm. like a tackle box. Mm -hmm. That that's my tools. That's all the tools I got. And I walked in, opened on the top, and had two slide doors. Didn't right, it? Yeah, and my it, dad has that know, same toolbox. <laughs> over here was these guys that had these mega <laughs> toolboxes. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't need much space, but. Uh, but quickly, I, I found out that, you know, I, and, and I was blessed to work with some very qualified, intelligent people. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I remember them to the day that taught me some, you know, to be a, an engine guy, you not only just stuff pistons in a hole, you, you've got to, you got to know how to fabricate, mm -hmm. you know, because in the old days, we made our own oil pans, we made our own headers. And I still do a lot of it, but right. uh, but I had some, and you know, forward financing. Right. That back then, they had the top people in all fields. That's kind of what I was going at yeah. for, right? Is that if it was just a shop, that's one thing. But the fact that it was essentially the Ford factory yeah. effort, right? To do, I guess it was. I mean, almost everything motorsports. I mean, I've been on it before, and Lee Holman showed me the the blueprints of the GT40. Yes. I mean, that was, people kind of know, okay, Ford versus Ferrari in the movies and uh, Carol and everything out there in the West Coast, but there was an element of all this in Charlotte at the time too, right? There was, you know, it was uh, the premier place for uh, for Ford, certainly, mm -hmm. and most, and uh, really motorsports in general, but, uh, so they had the best of everything at that time, right? And the resources were unlimited. So, I was fortunate to work with some of those people that took me under the wing and taught me, and uh, uh, got a lot of knowledge yeah. in a short time. Because I was only there from uh, like late uh, late '63, all of '64, mm -hmm. and left in the. Uh, Early '65. Okay. Uh, so you and Robert Yates weren't there at the same time. No, you, no Robert okay. was right behind me. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we we uh, you know again I got I was really fortunate to be able to work with Robert mm -hmm. as long with a lot of the other people and sadly quite a few of them aren't here today. Oh, I know it's it's heartbreaking mm -hmm. to be honest. But uh, no, it um, it's kind of ironic. I don't I don't want to dwell on it too much but uh, uh, you know I was there a short while and you know why why would you leave the premier place right <laughs> you know <laughs> and uh, I wasn't intending on it because okay. I just got married for one oh, thing yeah I'm sure yeah and uh, but we were we were making good money I was making I was making two dollar and thirty five cent an hour oh. and you were you were working you know 70 75 hours a week and getting time and a half right so we my wife and i present wife we uh our only wife uh, we were we'd saved our money so 
we bought a house before we got married. Oh, wow. You know, so okay. we still have that house. But um, I, um, um, well, the only, only way to put it is I was fired. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, and the reason I was fired, because John Holman was a very strict man. You know, I totally respect him. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've uh, kept a good relationship with, you know, Lee and mm -hmm. Randy when they were there. But uh, uh, I bought a piece of, um, actually, it's an old valve grinder because I tinkered at home. Okay. The, the few hours that I had, because I'd done some drag race, doing drag racing and so forth. And, um, but uh, I bought an old valve grinder from the Quickway guy. Yeah. Because it was a good deal. You know, and somebody, one of my friends, I don't know, they told John that you bought a valve about grinder. Valve grinder and said he's going to start his own shop. <laughs> so <laughs> oh my I come in one Monday morning and John called me to go to work before you clocked in. You had to walk right by his office. So you, you wouldn't be a minute late. You didn't want to be right. any yeah, late. Yeah, yeah. And uh, John called me in his office, or Mr. Holman called me in his office, and he said, I understand you want in business for yourself. Uh. Mm, no, I'm not planning on it. And uh, he, um, he, he said, well, I understand you bought some equipment. And, uh, <laughs> and I said, yes, sir, I did. And uh, please don't think that I'm being uh, uh, critical of him asked me that he had every right to do what he did but uh, he said well we can't have that and I said, what do you mean he said well you either uh, sell this piece of equipment and bring me a receipt where mm -hmm. you sold it or you know we don't need you anymore and uh, I thought, well, short in the story, I loaded up my toolbox <laughs> that day and had to go home and tell Patsy, I don't have a job, job anymore. anymore. <laughs> so I better start grinding some valves in my valve grinder to paper yeah. stuff. Yeah. Number one, number one, he was right. You did. And yeah. look what happened. Yeah. And number two, it was obviously the right and good thing to happen. And... Uh, you know, it was a different era then. It was a different world. We say it all the time about yeah. the, the way people used to hide information mm -hmm. uh, versus now where people are like desperately trying to right. share. We didn't all get drive. fired back in the day for, yeah. for doing what we're doing right now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is a fireable offense, yeah. sharing with people yeah. who are also interested. Uh, the well, secret sauce. I also know, too, because we're both men of, of faith, that God has a way of finding a path for you. Yeah. And that was the path he wanted you to go down to be able to touch the people that you've ended up touching in your life. So I think I, it's it's just, you, you never know what your path is gonna be. I truly believe that, you know, so. But that gave me the opportunity. In fact, you know, what goes around comes around, you mm -hmm. know, they say, but you know, I had, I, uh, and I stayed friends with a lot of the people over there. And uh, we actually did work for Lee. <laughs> you know, years yeah. years later. Yeah. You know, and uh, and so that it was. I was glad. I you know I was a little bitter. Uh, um, you know. Yeah. Or scared. Right. But uh, it's worked out, and it gave me that opportunity. Just like you were asking about uh, Ralph Earnhardt. You know, I knew Ralph because we were, you know, we're fifteen miles apart. But uh, you know, um, we he was he was a uh, hero or mentor mm -hmm. and uh so um that gave me that opportunity to expand right my knowledge so that way what was the move though all right like now you got a valve grinder and no job and a little box of tools how do you go from that moment to <sighs> daytona 500 winner yeah <laughs> <laughs> fortunately i had uh, some connections there that let me use a little two-bay garage you know somewhat rent free and I did brake jobs and tune ups and you know whatever until I was able to uh, first machine we bought was a balance machine and that's how I really got involved with Ralph Earnhardt in that the closest balance machine was in Winston-Salem which is an hour or a little better 
convenience. Away. And uh, Ralph told me, he said, look, here's what you got to do. You know, work by yourself just like you're doing. You know, do nothing but balance assemblies and you'll do good. And, uh, and we did. We did okay. But I couldn't stand that. You know, I couldn't stand <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, I, yeah. You know, I, I, I needed yeah. just like looking at the equipment here that's available, mm -hmm. you know. Man, you it's know, you can't, innovation to figure out and to drive and right. make mind. better. Yeah, you wanted to get out. You can't sit still. So, right. um, uh, he, uh, of course, you know, then I, you know, bought different pieces of equipment. And every time he'd come down, he said, I told you, I told you, you know, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> but I tell you, he told me another thing that uh, no racer believes. Uh, I didn't because we, we raced. Uh, actually, you know, Dale Sr., you know, drove a dirt car for us, you know, right. along with some others here back in that era. But Ralph told me, he said, uh, don't ever go to the, when we started racing, he said, don't ever go to the racetrack without, uh, don't ever go to the racetrack owing somebody for the tires or whatever. Mm -hmm. And don't ever go thinking that you're going to bring everything back because, you know, in a blink of an eye. Oh, yeah. It's gone. You yep. know, you, yep. you you blow an engine, you hit the wall, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, unless you can afford to lose everything, right. don't go. Fortunately, none of us listen to that. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's one, uh, one ear yeah. out the yeah, other. Yeah, yeah. It's good advice in theory. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And right. from what we know of son Dale Senior, uh, he didn't listen to that advice. <laughs> no, no, no. no, no. Like I say, fortunately for us, that uh, you know, racers don't think that way. Exactly. Yeah. If you guys have got a question for Keith, uh, this is an opportunity for you to get involved. Put it up in the chat session. If it's worth uh, worthwhile, we'll throw it his way and see what you got. Um, so speaking of Dell Senior and Daytona 500 wins and things, so back to Mark Cronkler's question: What were those things in the manifold? Yeah, what's up in the manifold? <laughs> <laughs> well, so we, let's preface it. So what we're talking about is the early days of restrictor plate racing, where the, you, they put a plate that had four holes in it underneath the carburetor in the old days of manifolds were open plenums like we're used to seeing but you guys came up with some interesting ways of trying to increase the efficiency of that engine because that plate under the carburetor really disrupted the air and just made a mess of the engine which is why it chucked on power right yeah and that goes back a long way so a lot probably a lot of the people out there don't understand what brought that about and 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 you know yep Bobby Allison. Allison. Yep, in the fence. You know, Talladega. And, and, you know, uh, fortunately he didn't, you know, right. kill a bunch of people. Right. It was horrific. Right. But the speeds were just so great uh, that they had to cut back. Yep. And their logic was, let's just cut back horsepower. So that mm -hmm. necessitated the restrictor plate. So we took a, excuse me, a 600 horsepower engine and mm -hmm. cut it back to 400 or less. Mm-hmm. So our job was to make more horsepower, make more power, right. gain some of that back. back. And uh, rules were very restrictive about it. Punishments were very severe. severe. But uh, through, and I had to say there was there was no engine engineering data or technology to help correct what was going on. Because for one thing, we didn't know what was going on. Right, and I, I remember on the dyno we would put this, say a fifteen sixteen four fifteen sixteen hole, right, knock two hundred horsepower out of the engine, and we'd make changes to jetting and rock arms. You you know none none of it made any difference. Right, we and uh, and every time I would take the restrictor plate off, there'd be droplets of fuel. Just suspended hanging on the bottom of that plate and why is that you know I, I mm -hmm. couldn't figure it out so when I, when I finally got a grasp the how I finally got a grasp of what was going on is I cut a manifold up put some windows in it and uh, um, put a uh, crash helmet on okay and went and then got right there mm -hmm. and watching 
what was happening. Oh my gosh. And John uh, Kazi before John Kazi. Yeah, exactly. So on, the, <laughs> on, the, on the dyno, you're up right up on it. Right. Watching. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, that that's how we spin Tron now. Yeah. A screwdriver on the valve cover, you know, while my son's, yeah. while my son's running, yeah. and you know, and he listen for yeah. the... Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, but, uh, oh, I hope our main for the not watching. Yeah. But, uh, That's all a joke. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but anyway... Yeah, so you were watching the manifold. And you, you, yeah, and you know, the carburetor atomizes the fuel air mixture, mm -hmm. and it's coming down through, and it's a nice big cloud. Mm -hmm. Well, the velocity picked up so much going through those four small holes mm -hmm. that it was separating the, and you could actually see that, you know, uh, high speed filming would, would have helped and it did later on. Right. But then it was just all out of brain. Yeah. But you could see. You just knew fuel shouldn't be there. It should be down in the combustion well, chamber. It, it was separating. The, right. You know, you, that, that atomization was going to back to a liquid mm -hmm. and the airspeed was so great that the fuel could hit the floor yep. and then it bounced back up. Okay. So we knew we had to do two things, slow the, increase Air the airflow and slow that speed down. Right. And uh, it was through just hours and hours and hours of trial and error mm -hmm. that we were able to do that with different tubes and mm -hmm. so forth. And it worked. We finally, through trial and error, hit on a, something that actually worked and we gained a sizable amount of power. Um, and essentially that was because there's four holes in the in the spacer mm -hmm. or the plate there were four tubes in the manifold that would kind of help that transition right right and it had to be one piece you know nascar mm -hmm. so we made it we made a block to go in mm -hmm. you know uh in the manifold and then four like a inch and three quarter straight hole mm -hmm. and then then you could take the lay and machine the tubes different radiuses and yep. so forth uh and just Tape drop them in, in. right yeah so you could try and then once you hit on the setup then you made it in one piece right so uh, you know a lot of wasted effort and money you know when you were trying to the object was to kill horsepower and then you spend thousands and thousands much like you do now right they marked that here earlier said yeah. the exact same thing yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 now why do we have a Ten thousand dollar crankshaft and engine makes five hundred and fifty horsepower. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, but, but that was a great innovation, though, right? Just that quest. To, okay, we got this problem. We got to find it. We got to find it. This really out of the box thinking is like you would have never thought that the way to make more power with this little bitty tiny plate was to essentially fill up the manifold full of stuff, but leave these little holes in there, and it was it was huge. Uh, gains to be had but by doing that but well you know it's yes it was and a lot of it's you know by accident and usually somebody has done it previously mm -hmm. but that was new that had never been done before right but some of the improvements that we made were done decades and decades before that and and uh one thing that we found out we we uh, inadvertently stuck two plates together. Mm -hmm. Wow, did we pick up power. They were the same size, right. still a restrictor, but we picked up so much power. Well, that, um, that increase in the thickness of that actually helped the air. It gave it that extra just eighth of an inch. Just to turn to, a little Yeah, bit. and then just uh, if you want, can you, can you, would you share about what you did with the, the spacer gasket? Oh, the, the carburetor gasket? Yeah. 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 After that, when we found that out, I thought, oh gosh, you know, we can, uh, we can make some gains here that might not be illegal. Right. They may be, but m more likely. Yeah, if it's me, not in the rule book, yeah. it's not illegal. So, well, it is now, but it used to be not that back then. So we got some blank carburetor gaskets and put our own holes in them which were the same size as the plate as, as the plate and uh it was a sixty thousandths gasket uh that you still use mm -hmm. you can still use and um but that in effect was just like a adding that other restrictor plate made that distance far and you hit a punch so it kind of actually radius it right a bit. and then the more you ran it just in case we didn't want to draw attention, so we spray painted them silver. 
so you you really couldn't yeah. see it unless you were really, really looking. close yeah but the more you ran it the more horsepower we gained because it kept on yeah that <laughs> gasket would swell and then it would put a little radius going into it and the boundary layer was so much less it was like putting a bigger plate on it <laughs> and it was uh it was amazing how much power and uh but we got by with that for quite a while even on some of the you remember when they run the all pro yes up here at Bristol, mm -hmm. they run the All Pro race up here, and they had, you know, they were so fast they had to put restrict plates on it. Well, um, <laughs> um, I don't think I'd get in trouble for this. Uh, Ron on today, yeah, was driving a car that uh, from the West Coast mm -hmm. that we'd got hooked up with, and and uh, boy, did that little restrictor plate trick help oh yeah <laughs> but that but we did that gasket yeah and uh he just annihilated them but uh it was almost a license to steal <laughs> you know? but uh i don't know that's uh that wasn't cheating that's not cheating no that's not that's innovation yeah. that's innovation yeah. not cheating innovation yeah, or luck would. or luck you accidentally put two plates on one day and figured out something by mistake, like the guy who invented fire by getting struck by lightning, like, you know. <laughs> now, it was cheating after that. Right, When yes. they found out what we were doing. Right. But, uh, so. Well, and you. So uh, I, had a, I had a clear conscience. Yes, sir. And still exactly. there, so so we, we've talked a little bit about the Earnhardts. We've got a couple of questions about Bonneville, but I just want to ask you about the Daytona 500 win, because you had such a great relationship with uh, the Earnhardts, but the Daytona 500 win that you got kind of took something away from the Earnhardts, 1990. Yeah, yeah, you know, everybody wanted Dale to win, you know, and he had to race one. Oh, you yeah. Know, we were we were going to run second. Right. You know, and... Uh, I only wish Bill Elliott had a flat tire on the last lap in 85. Mm, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it it, uh, it just, it was one of those things that uh, uh, was meant to be, mm -hmm. you know, and... Uh, you know the car, an independent car that, that Derek Cope was driving. Mm -hmm. uh, you know he earned it. He was fast all week. Yeah, you, you got to be there. And he was in second place. He was going to finish second. Had he not, you know, yeah, Dale Lott had his problem. But uh, but it's still, as they say now, it was still a W. Yeah, it's well, a W. Uh, it's a motor race. So that in that moment, though, you're the engine builder. That's your engine running second. I would imagine like you're very invested in the final lap of the Daytona 500. So can, what did you think in the moment? How did you process what was happening? Well, you know, uh, it's, I didn't watch that race. I wasn't there. Uh, <laughs> our, our daughter was, uh, who was a teenager at the time was having some very serious health problems. Okay. And, uh, my wife, myself and her was at the uh, Baptist hospital in Winston Salem. We didn't even know he'd won the race till later. And uh, you went to <clears throat> you went to Daytona 500, and you you know you how do you capitalize on it? Right. It was the last thing on my mind at the time. At right. The time. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. Uh, very proud. Very proud of it. Uh, and yeah, later we stuck our chest That's out. Oh, you know, course, yeah. we were happy. But uh, but in the moment, the perspective was like, right. this doesn't matter. Yeah. It, yeah. it doesn't change this. No, no. So, let's talk about Bonneville. So yeah. here's, a, here's a question from Chris. Uh, could you have Mr. Dorton expand on the differences between circle track racing engines and Bonneville speed trials, approach to engine design, build, etc.? Well, that's, that's a lot simpler than you would think. Uh, the oval track stuff and even the drag race things that we do uh you know we you know it takes power we we do everything we can to achieve power mm -hmm. but like on an oval track engine it's you've got to you got to come off the corner and plus you got to have end of the straightaway speed right and so the engines has to be tailored tuned whatever mm -hmm. to do that at bonneville you're running on a little bitty skinny tire. There's no traction. It's like driving on ice almost. Okay. So you don't, you can't use it. You don't want any low end power. 
but you want it all on the top. Okay. So uh, we took, when we first started going out there, we took an old NASCAR engine <clears throat> and, you know, it was making 800 and change horsepower. Right. Of course, they ran good out there, you know, with a regular 4150 carburetor. So Jeff and myself, we got to thinking, you know, what, you know, they were having trouble with traction. So right. what, what can we do? So we want to kill some bottom end, but we want to make more power on top. It's all about airflow, you know, mm -hmm. at least our theory was. We didn't change camshafts, we didn't change cylinder heads, we did nothing but take a manifold and mm -hmm. cut it apart, really blow it out, L looked primarily at the line of sight from the top of the plenum chamber to the intake valve, mm -hmm. and got as good a line of sight as we could, blowed the plenum way out, raised it, um, and put a um, dominator flange on it. Okay. And we put this on the dyno, and we picked up 60 horsepower. Wow. We didn't believe it. Jeff and I, neither one, thought that was possible. So um, we got the weights out mm -hmm. the dyno, verified yep. everything. Got to make sure the dyno's right. Still yep. didn't believe it. We put the old manifold back on. We lost the 60. We put the new one back on. We gained it. When we went to Monoville the next time, it showed up on the racetrack. Since that time, some of the even the small cubic inch engines for the different classes out there, we have found that we can't get enough air. You know, we've got okay. 300 cubic inch engines that have two 2,000 CFM throttle bodies on. Do you think it's because of how high the altitude is there, and just how? No, it's because um, it's because of um, we don't care how the engine runs below 7,000 RPMs, you know? Right. I mean, this thing, if you if you went to Daytona or somewhere, uh, that engine wouldn't pull out the piss. <laughs> <laughs> but from 7,500 to 85 or 99,000, it, it, it goes. Mm -hmm. And I guess too, it, it's that long stretch. You have, you're running for miles on end at wide open throttle that maybe having more volume of air available just continues to feed it so mm -hmm. you don't like a I'm, I'm thinking about a carburetor in uh, the float balls if you run out of fuel run out of power you just got to have tons and tons of, of air because if, right you're just moving so much air through it yeah now when I came and talked to you about coming here you guys were working on some cars for Bonneville, some guys had driven from Texas and they were on the way to, to Bonneville. Tell, tell everybody about what that little story was because I think y'all set a record out there, right? In August? Or uh, October? Or October, August, October. October. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was in October. Yeah, they, you know, it was, uh, we, uh, we missed August, uh, Jeff and I did because of the COVID, mm -hmm. but we were fortunate. We got three records then, but uh, this, this customer was... Uh, got a street roadster which is one of the oldest most prestigious classes there mm -hmm. different engine sizes right but, but anyway his goal was to make it the world's fastest street roadster okay and uh, so we put a pro charger on you know 370 cubic inch engine and because they had a bigger engine before right yeah yeah they and uh, but anyway he uh, uh, was able to uh, not only break the record by 14 miles an hour for Sma that. Yeah, smashed it. For, it's not breaking, it's smashing. For the class, <laughs> but he actually uh, achieved being the world's fastest street roadster at 260 miles an hour. Uh, and the previous record holder was a blown double A, which is unlimited cubic inch. Uh, so, and we did it with a small block small block yeah so. that's what i thought was cool it was like yeah. man this is kind of neat because yeah. before when you, when you were telling me about that that's before we actually had the pro charger hooked up for our engine i'm like okay i remember keith said this thing like it was amazing they went from you know blown big block as much keep it as you want and they destroy the record this little small block with this pro charger i'm thinking this could be interesting <laughs> but you know one thing about 
land speed racing or the salt flats is uh, people back here in this mm -hmm. part of the country and other parts of the country, other types of racers say, right. well, you know, that's got to be the most boring thing and, you know, easiest thing in the world to do. Well, you know, it's a big dyno. I mean, it'll bring you to your knees because you're, you know, a NASCAR engine, you can, um, you know, run for 500 miles and they're turning a lot of RPMs and mm -hmm. so forth. But uh, very lightweight stuff. But here we take a, the NASCAR type thing and we try to make more power. Mm -hmm. And boy, it's hard on them to run for five miles, hammer down. Uh, so, yeah, we broke some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Keith, this has been great. Thank you very much. Uh, second time we've got to, you know, put you on the spot here on Hidden Horsepower. You can go back and listen to the previous episode. We entertained a lot of different stories in that one as well. Wherever you get your podcast, Apple Podcasts and Spotify. This has been so great, though. Lake, uh, amazing. And, and, you know, we could just pepper you with questions, like, all day. Like, you know, what what, what do you want to – I'm going to stretch it out just for a few more seconds. Yeah. What – would you like to do that you haven't already done? Is there a field, an arena, an area that you you would like to investigate? Like maybe you can get something done in that field. Well, we we ventured out into a lot of different things since you know we're not doing well. We're not doing any NASCAR you know work anymore. Right. But uh, you know I've always been a hot rodder gearhead. So you know the biggest challenges we're doing now which is a challenge is some of the vintage things yes that we're doing and try to try to take an engine that was uh, designed for 100 horsepower and make 600 right and live and be able to drive it because a, a lot of things that we're doing now are street driven and uh they're they are as challenging as the manifolds for daytona mm -hmm. and everything else and it's, uh, it, I still find myself two o'clock in the morning waking up and these weird ideas coming through. Well, you're you talking about that flathead you were building recently and trying to make that power of the flathead and the fact that it only has three mains in it and I mean, all those little challenges. Yeah. That's yeah. So there's a, lot, there's a lot going forward I want to do. Well, good. That that's gives awesome. us more content for a future episode of Hidden Horse Power. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for joining us here thank, at the Engine Performance Expo. Thank you for having me. Excellent, excellent. There it. is more to come. How great was that, guys?